Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of The War Report, the first episode of December 2022. You'll be hearing this on a nice early Saturday afternoon if you're listening to the premiere, so welcome to all of you. Of course, I'm your host, Constantine Martelli, and we have the one, the only, GSP, <laughs> co-host of the Hello. show for like four years and running. I mean, we're, we're coming up on the, I think we're coming up on about five years of the show now, that's... You, you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought it would it's have, have gone on this long. And, it doesn't feel like four years. You know? Oh no, it 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 certainly does not. And we're I I not sure whether I mentioned this on the episode last week, but I was talking to you about it. I know this for sure that the New Year's episode, the year in review, is going to be uh going to be like four and a half hours probably at this rate with how much ground we have to cover. And this is going to probably be. Our, our standard two-hour show, because that's what they're up to nowadays with how much news we actually have to sift through. I remember when we struggled to get to an hour. I remember those days back when the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> with the news cycle where I, I would just find the most... Irrelevant Not in 2022. <laughs> Thanks, Putler. <laughs> <laughs> I would just find the most relevant stories 2018, 2019 to try to get that hour mark, but yeah, the, the show writes itself now, and it's become easier than ever, but it's also become much more enriching that way because there's just so much to cover. Mm. Of course, if you haven't already, you can go ahead and check out our alternative platforms linked in the description if anything were to ever happen to our main platform here on YouTube. But without further ado, let's get into the show. I'm sure you have some interesting reports regarding Ukraine. I certainly do have a few stories, but as usual, I'll allow you to begin with just a brief update. Okay, uh, so there's nothing going on in Ukraine. Next story. No, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> I'll begin with Battlefront news, and um, so the, I'll I'll start with the south, work east, and then to the north. Uh, in Kherson, um, basically it's a static uh, front line. Uh, no one is trying to cross uh, the river. The Russians have begun shelling uh, Kherson, and it, last week I mentioned that the. Basically, the energy infrastructure in Kherson is gone, and there are videos of long queues of cars abandoning Kherson. There are also interviews, I'm oh, sorry, not interviews, but people loading up, you know, videos on TikToks, uh, not on TikTok, other social media on their phones, basically describing how half the city is abandoned. There's one woman in particular, she did a video last week and she did another video that was posted today on Telegram. And basically she said, you know, some of the hardline uh, guys like Tornado. So Tornado, Kraken, these guys are like Azov essentially, right? Kraken even had like an, an ex-pedophile that was put in jail and then Zelensky freed him, uh, who's running r one of the Kraken units. So... These are also the kind of guys that uh, I would say are like the Georgian Legion. Um, they probably execute and torture prisoners. They're extremely hardline. And she said that they've basically indiscriminately begun shelling homes and stuff. Because they kind of look at everybody in that region as scum. Like even the ones that waited for them to be liberated by the Ukrainians um they look at them as as scum you know there's this historically nova russian territory why didn't you give a bigger fight like i'm sure there's all kinds of excuses and um there's also photos that um have come in of guys with like um it's an it's a nazi insignia that forms a, an x with uh two grenades those long barrel shaped grenades and it's the same insignia that was used by one of the, like, literally one of the worst uh, SS uh, groups that uh, was also made up of uh, criminals, basically. And um, so uh, the Russians are intensely firing on Kherson. Um, there has not been a new attempt to seize the Zaporozhia nuclear power plant. Um, there are more talks with the IAEA uh, to try to figure out some kind of solution. Uh, they know very well that it's the Ukrainians that are shelling it. 
Uh, but as I've said many times, and I've said it years ago, long before this war, uh, that the UN, uh, no more than the World Bank, is uh, a neutral party. It is essentially an American institution. It is there as a false neutral. It is there to satisfy that whole uh, particularly um, sort of liberal notion from uh, the Age of Enlightenment era about rationalism, right? If you have someone that's completely neutral and unbiased, that maybe then you can get the truth. It's a false neutral. That's It's there to rubber stamp um, essentially uh, the prevailing regime and its narratives. So um, now employees, all employees uh, that refuse to sign contracts uh, to, to work under Russian authorities in the Saporozhye nuclear power plant have been fired and it has been discovered that they, some of them were giving coordinates uh, to the Ukrainian army for shelling. I'm tempted to think that the reason uh, they, they probably gave coordinates that were, depending on how accurate the HIMARS are, they were probably giving them coordinates that would come close to a total catastrophe, but not quite. That's my conspiracy theory. That's my high octane conspiracy theory. I mean, it's reasonable enough enough to make the hairs on the back of everyone's neck stand up without causing any real calamity, which is exactly what they've wanted since this first started in March. I'm sure you all remember back yeah. in March when there was the. It was frontline news. Just appeared until about September, October. Came back in the news cycle and crops up here periodically, here and there now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's essentially turned off. It has to be. Uh, otherwise, it's a, you know, it's a disaster in the making. So hopefully, these latest developments might help. I don't know. Um, there isn't as much shelling as there has been in previous weeks, though. Um, there was a, an apparent offensive that was supposed to be uh, started uh, in order to take Melitopol that would divide Kherson from Mariupol, Donbass. That has still not transpired. The Russians have now uh, inched closer around Ugladar. Uh, they are making more headway. Last week, I, I mentioned the town called Opotne. Now, there are two Opotnes, and there's another town some months back. Uh, Zaitseva was, is another town. There are two towns with the name Zaitsev or Zaitseva. Okay. And so it's very funny that in like southern Donbass, there's a town with the same name as more central northern Donbass around Bakhmut. So forgive me if uh, if I wasn't clear enough, uh, but it's Opotne was the the town that was taken that's around of uh, where the most amount of trenches and hardline fighters for Ukraine have been stationed for for eight years. That area now, from the latest maps that I've seen, is getting cut off. Uh, over half of Marinka is taken. So the Russians are making headway, but the biggest headway that has happened now is around Bakhmut. Um, three towns on Tuesday fell on the same day that have allowed the Russians to now begin inching towards the west side of Bakhmut. They have secured a very strong southern hold just south of the other Opotnia, uh, uh village that is essentially a suburb of, uh, of Bakhmut. And uh, U.S. media now has come out. Um, I don't recollect whether it was the Washington Post or the New York Times, uh, but it was one of those two papers that uh, basically admitted. Of course, it tacitly had to include the Russians have suffered great losses there, too. But they had to admit uh, that the Ukrainians are taking extraordinary losses there. Now, I believe Newsweek uh, interviewed uh, General Wesley Clark. Uh, this is a, an interesting point that he made several interesting points. He echoed basically other media's uh, sources that have said um, 
that the Ukrainians are trying to plug as many holes in Bakhmut. That ba he described Bakhmut as a kind of a bag. I guess you could look at it as a cauldron. It's, a, it's the city's getting essentially surrounded, and um, he looked at it as a kind of a killing zone. The Russians call it a meat grinder. It essentially means the same thing. That was one of the points that he made. The other was about the possible winter offensive. And I thought he made a very salient uh, point that other ex-military commentators have not. And that is about if there's going to be a winter offensive, uh, where is it going to be? And I mean a Russian winter offensive, not a Ukrainian one. Because southern Ukraine, according to him, he had been monitoring the situation from December of 2021 well into 2022 and thereafter from um, after the war started. And he said southern Ukraine never completely froze over. Uh, at the moment, uh, I believe the interview was done right at the end of November or maybe the first day of December. The ground does freeze over. Uh, in the nighttime, but in the day it could it's, it begins to thaw again, and if it rains, it just makes things worse. Um, so if there is going to be some kind of great counteroffensive, it would have to happen later uh, when the ground would freeze over. Mind you, it's not like another important point that he mentioned was, you know, we're not, this is not World War II. Ukraine has far more roads now. Of course, the roads are susceptible to mines and uh, tanks can be picked off more easily because you have these forest lines between farmers' properties uh, where soldiers have dugouts and trenches and from there can fire at tanks. Um, so there is a kind of vulnerability there. Ideally, you would want the tanks to have the ability to go over fields if you, if you had to. This is where tracked vehicles, uh, do better than wheeled vehicles. Um, the other interesting point about Newsweek is, um, they had a, um, a, a basically the, the head commander, one of the, top commanders of the Ukrainian army who is in Bakhmut right now. Um, his name is, I believe, Petro Kuzek or Petro Kuzek, Kuzik. Um, he said that our troops are now in trenches that are littered with the corpses of Ukrainian soldiers. I mean, that's really something. And we'll get into it later, but um, that seems to kind of justify uh, Ursula van der Leyen's uh, tweet from a couple of days ago about the numbers of uh, the number of losses uh, on behalf of Ukraine in this war now uh, in our ninth month. So, uh, yes, so that's the situation there in the north. Uh, the lines are incredibly stable. Uh, the Russians have recaptured Belagorovka. Uh, the Ukrainians have not been able to puncture anything. Um, there's been a small gain by the Russians um, in the Kupiansk direction. So this is further north. It's north of uh, Svatove. So I would say Things are pretty much as they were last week, with the exception that the front of Ugladar has stabled. The Russians have not been pushed um, out of um, the Ugladar direction. They are closing in on it. And in Bakhmut, the major gains uh, have happened uh, in the south. And so the announcement, of course, is after two months of training, the rest of the mobilization units, it won't mean all of them, but the majority of them, because some units will require longer training than others. Some of them is uh, dependent on how long they've been away from the military. Um, other issues are 
some units are expected to uh, deal with different tasks uh, and will need more training. But uh, the figures that I'm seeing now, if you include the volunteers with the original mobilization unit, it's it's around 380,000. So even if you take away the 82,000 that have already entered the front lines, there's another 300,000 that is going to go on into the front line now uh, in the next few days or the next few weeks. And then that and also that, brings but, up the question of how many frontline forces does Ukraine actually have? Since I'm sure we all remember at the beginning of the war, them claiming they've raised a million men at arms and that they uh, are completely prepared to defend the country, all the stuff that always comes up before a war. But I, and perhaps this is just for lack of looking in the right places, maybe you know, maybe somebody in the audience knows, how many like active duty combat troops Ukraine actually has in the front line right now? I haven't been able to find a solid number on that. I haven't either. A lot of people have said that Ukraine's best soldiers have already been killed. I mean, I think the majority probably have, but I don't know if that's 51% or 81%. I don't know. Um, Ukraine, if you wanted to include like every single man that was given a gun and at least some kind of training uh, by February 24th, 25th, did have 500,000 troops. Now, the thing is, is at least 200,000 of those troops are essentially border guards. Uh, like some of the um, units that the Russians sent up in the Kharkov direction that are basically trained to like a SWAT team or like a, a paramilitary police force, if you will, right? It's not quite military, and they're not given the same level of training or equipment, I would presume. But they did have like a, a half a million army with different degrees of professionalism, and uh, the kit varied depending on you know what division they were in. But like you, I don't know. I don't know what they've they've had many mobilizations. Um, some have said it's been like five or six. Some of them are saying that they're, they've already done their eighth and they're going to go on their ninth, but they've had several mobilizations. And the, the, the recent figure I've seen is they want to recruit another 100,000 men. But th that's the frontline uh, update for Ukraine for now. Now, I did have a, another story relating to Ukraine that's a bit of a follow-up on something we discussed a few months back. So, I just want to preface this one saying that although geopolitics seems like a mess, getting into the ecclesiastical politics of the church is even more of a mess. And I want to briefly touch on some of the news that came out today. Now, this is a developing story, so we only know so much, so I'm just going off of the information I have available to me right now. This could be outdated very quickly, so please just bear, bear with me here. So, after months since the beginning of this war, there have been crackdowns on the Ukrainian Orthodox churches that are still in communion yeah. with the Patriarch of Moscow. Now, given the structure of everything... It, it, it's been for quite some time now where it is a formal relationship where a Patriarch Kirill, who is the, the current Patriarch of Moscow, while he is the head of the church, he isn't the direct authority over it. That's Again, right. that, that it, it falls to Kiev at that rate. So in 2018, just to give a brief background on the scenario, you have an effort by Constantinople... Uh, being more or less egged on by the State Department, as tends to happen, to create a new Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And they were created in about 2016, maybe a little before then. Their momentum picked up in 2018. That's when the schism that I, I primarily blame Mike Pompeo for yeah. actually started in full force. And since then, it's been a constant back and, and Bartholomew forth. patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople yeah. he's been instrumental in this 
Yes. And th this all came to a head in 2018. And with that being said, you had the situation was tense, but it didn't really boil over until the actual outbreak of war. Then you had several localities in Ukraine forcing the church still in communion with Moscow to go under this new church or disband or various um, measures were taken. And then today you have Zelensky coming out saying that he wants to completely do away with this. He wants to put like complete like wartime measures on this. Now, this isn't the first time he's done these wartime measures, whether that be with other political parties banning all parties that were officially in opposition, cracking down on media, things that you would expect to happen. But he has gone the extra length in a church that I couldn't give you an exact percentage of the Ukrainian population, but a significant percentage of the Ukrainian population, especially in the east, and even in quite a bit in the center of the country, are still adherents of. And this does, yes, it does justify what many of the... Uh, what many were saying at the beginning of this war, that it may take a quasi-religious, if not outright religious nature, because I, I've said from the beginning, I still maintain, it, it is primarily an ethnic conflict, and it's also primarily a conflict between Russia and NATO. But now they've taken the step, they've legitimized everything that they've tried to write off, you know, saying, oh, that's just fear mongering propaganda, oh, Russia's trying to use religion as some sort of uh, propaganda tool, blah, 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 blah. Well, at, at this point, they've justified everything they said, because you have the Zelensky government right now outright trying to ban it. Now, whether this... Yeah, actually... they, took, they took the Lavra in Kiev, the caves in Kiev, on which, uh, if people have been watching this war closely, you'll see some of the beautiful churches in, in central Kiev. Underneath them, you know, there's a, there's a cave system, and some of the earliest um, Christians in that region um, and monastics, uh, you know, lived in those caves. Uh, well, the caves have been, that's that's totally gone now. It is no longer part of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. We should also remember that in Western Ukraine, uh, back in March, uh, Zelensky outlawed the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Churches have been uh, overtaken by the, I mean, to me, the schismatics of, uh, you know, the new Ukrainian Orthodox Church that Bartholomew and Pompeo helped create uh, in preparation for this war. That's what it's really all about. And ever since 2016, you know, there have been priests um, and Bishops and monks that, that have been jailed, uh, some have gone missing, some of them are dead, frankly, including some very close around the, uh, the Kiev region. Just And west of now it. that you bring that up, I couldn't find a solid source on this, but I did see speculation, so we'll see how the situation develops, that the Zelensky government offered a possible prisoner exchange because of the disparity in prisoners. Of war yes. With <laughs> clergy. They'll do anything for those Azov guys. With clergy again, to exchange for a prisoner of, uh, of war that Russia has. So that, the situation has completely boiled over, and this, once again, puts a entirely new dynamic in the war. Not that it wasn't there before, but it has been brought to the forefront, and I don't see oh, how yeah. anyone can uh, really deny this. And, of course, you'll have a lot of people come in and defend this, well, like, well, oh, these churches are collaborationists, they're uh, under Moscow. So, I mean, but, I mean, once again, that is a a formality. It, when it comes to any functionality, no. And when it comes to where they actually stood in the war, they called for the end of the war on the Ukrainian side. I mean, keep in mind, most of, most of their faithful are, again, Ukrainian. And at, at this point... In uh, we should also remember... Right. The, yeah, go ahead. the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was there with the protesters in Kiev. Recently, they have taken relics from of Alexander Nevsky and the 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 name of a of a priest um, escapes me, but a relic of, of, a, of a priest. They have gone down even in the Kherson region using these relics 
of what were ostensibly Russian saints uh, in order to uh, boost the morale of Ukrainian troops. R right? Like, I mean, there's I, I, the, the, the one thing that I always find in, in this war ever since 2014 onwards is when things aren't going right, they just lash out. There, there's a paranoia that sets in and then they go after anybody that's like could be considered not Ukrainian enough. Right. Anybody that, that they feel suspicious of. So, like I said at the beginning of the show, it could be residents that intentionally stayed behind. Right. Like there's estimates that about 100 uh, civilians in Kherson have already been executed. Right. On suspicion of being collaborators. We know in Bucha that there were probably people that were executed. Uh, there's a video of them beating up people in Irpin because, you know, food wasn't getting in and they were taking food from the Russian soldiers. But that was enough for them to be considered Vatniks, right? They should all die um, because there was no other way to feed themselves. Like, you know... It's, it just it boggles the mind, right? And um, it's just it's another episode of uh, of paranoia, especially when things aren't going well for them. Um, uh, they will they will lash out. And I understand there's also like long range reasons why this is happening, right? Like there can only be one legitimate Ukrainian Orthodox Church. There cannot be two. Uh, uh, any kind of association with Russians uh, has to be severed forever. And uh, this is one of the ways you go about it. Oh, absolutely. Well, once again, something of that's at that point just a formality, no real authority exercised over the church in Ukraine is being used as, once again, they're completely lying about this, using this as a justification to outright ban it. And it does make me wonder how this will affect the course of the war, how this will affect the opinions on the ground in Ukraine, how this will affect morale, because, once again, while a lot of people may want to say this is a secondary issue, up until recently, up until it really escalated up until these past few days, I never discounted that it was a part of it, but I always said it took a backseat to a lot of the ethnic tensions and the geopolitical tensions, but at this point, I don't see how it doesn't, and if... This is the case, and we we know Zelensky does uh, not act entirely independently. He always does have somebody in his ear. They're gearing up now, whether they're actually going to deliver on that, but they, they want to attempt to gear up for something larger, in my opinion, if they're going to take a move that is, frankly, this drastic. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I think there's a, a lot of uh, motivation. You know, I don't want to... I Well, I kind of do... Uh, let's, uh, let's look at, you know, the missile strike, because I think it can reveal, um, who are like some of the factions within the decision, make decision making, uh, structure of Ukraine, right? If we look at the missile, the two missiles that landed in Poland and killed two, uh, Polish civilians, right? Now we discussed, like, there was a long period of time before anybody reported on it. Uh, the polls were initially very excited, but once in it, once it was obvious that it was not a Russian missile, they began quickly to retract um, some of their initial statements. And then finally, they went on board. Zelensky has not changed his mind. He gave a recent UN uh, speech where he he said that, uh, you know, that these were Russian missiles. Right. And, you know, basically like some covid facts are no longer facts but they're still repeated or there's certain uh, old facts about what happened in on uh, Jan uh, 6th that are actually not facts anymore. Uh, they still get repeated. They don't care about that. So, but to, to get to my point, um, let's say that there was a fact that like there's, there's a faction within command uh, in Ukraine Um that feels NATO weapons are not coming fast enough or in large quantities enough to make a difference, particularly just before winter. 
and that the cost for the success in Kherson and Kharkov was too great. And without more material, it's not going to happen. In other words, Ukraine might have to um, find a way for NATO to enter the war, or at least a coalition of the willing to enter the war. Let's say that um, maybe a captain, like maybe not all the way high up in command, he orders these missiles to fly into Poland. Of course, the Americans would be completely aware as to even which unit launched them. They would they they knew all along, right? But let's say we're being generous and it, it's only a faction that is like more desperate. Like you can imagine, like the only way to like stop this war is literally for the army in Ukraine to rebel against Zelensky. But then what happens to Zelensky? The fear of like the nationalist units killing him is very real if he acquiesces. I'm sure he knows that. So um, I think I think in this situation, something like that is also happening, right? There's a faction that's probably been putting pressure. We have to get rid of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Forget about the optics. Uh, enough is enough. Uh, we, we can't trust any of them. Even if they're worthy of being uh, uh, trusted, we've got two different Ukrainian churches. Uh, th th that's ridiculous. And we have to jettison the old one that is still in communion with Moscow, however formal that is, uh, however much they've condemned uh, Moscow, which they have, uh, it's not good enough. So there's a purity test going on. Uh, but that, to me, indicates probably there is a faction that has been putting on the pressure on Zelensky to finally do this, and the decision has been made. Um, well, it's interesting, the, it's interesting you brought that up, speaking of the faction and the pressure they might feel, because I think that does lead into some of the news we have about the statements by both van der Leyen and Stoltenberg. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can take yeah, it from yeah. here. So you had the Van der Leyen speech, which we did mention earlier, where she said in this, giving her report on the war to Ukraine to whatever organ of the European Union she was speaking to at the time, that Ukraine has incurred about 100,000 casualties. Now, this was at first profusely denied, then it was ignored, then it was by channels that, again, you won't hear about unless you pay a lot of attention, tacitly accepted mm. and this was around the time this coincided with the or quote unquote coincided with the statement by stoltenberg saying that ukraine is fighting awards for its sovereignty and nato admission cannot be considered at this time and would only consider ukraine and nato once it wins this war which is more or less now of course stoltenberg nato this entire command structure is known for its constant reneging, constant back and forth on these sort of issues. So we could see a different opinion in just a few weeks' time on this. But the direction that at least Stoltenberg is hinting at right now is that Ukraine and NATO is something that is not on the agenda either now or any time in the near future. And once again, his exact words here were, quote, the main task for Ukraine is to now remain an independent state and not to join NATO, which does mm. show at least a level of discontent in Europe with the war effort, it, despite even going back a few months, some of Ukraine's even successes. And that's from about late August up until about a month ago. Early November. Or early November, where you did see a significant Ukrainian pushback, where it did look like the momentum of the war was changed in their favor, and arguably did for a short time before things froze over, which is the state we're at now. November was not a very active month for the war at all. But with what you see is, this is also on top of, and Stoltenberg has said this multiple times about the war, including recently, that... This is a war for Western civilization. Well, not those exact words, but this is the war for su the survival and the influence of the West. This is vital that we win this. Bringing in this very apocalyptic rhetoric, for lack of a better word, that either we win this or we lose everything. And almost mirroring what you, yeah. what you get in Russia from, from Putin at times. But then he's also saying that 
well, Ukraine's task to remain an independent state and not to join NATO. He, having this very grandiose rhetoric while also trying to keep Ukraine at an arm's length, trying to walk on this very narrow tightrope. So it does... Now, I'm under no illusion that NATO is going to drop support for Ukraine anytime in the near future, but at least in my analysis, it does show a level of discontent that although they're willing to employ this sort of rhetoric, they're not willing to fully commit to it. And it does look like, in a way, they are planning for a Ukrainian defeat or some sort of stalemate in this war, or something that isn't the outcome that they would have desired with a re ejection of Russia from Ukraine, or at least bogging down Russia to the point where they become an ineffectual adversary. But it looks like they are hedging their bets against that, at least for the time being, at least with what they're saying right now. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to, like, the, the, I, those statements are very telling, and I think your conclusions are bang on. Now, what direction will the war continue if if all that we've surmised is true and we've properly analyzed their statements? I think the next phase now will be, um, they'll try to turn it into a kind of Afghanistan. Right. Now, I don't I think they always wanted that. And so far, that has not happened. Yes, we've discussed on this show. It hasn't happened recently, but there have been mayors, deputy mayors, um, uh, organizers of like, you know, like um, uh, sports union, um, you know, de deputy police chiefs who's, you know, that are blown up in their cars like that has been going on but not necessarily the last two months right and as much as those things you know were impactful and intimidating it is those things are not happening anywhere near the numbers that they need right like the only way they can get an afghanistan situation is where the Ukrainian army uh, begins to go on a kind of retreat, but fighting where the Russians have to be pulled into regions that are definitely anti-Russia. And them minding those areas uh, will become problematic. It simply has not happened that there was ever enough Ukrainian support, particularly in the regions where the Russians are, uh, for them to be attacked. Notice that Russia held uh, the area around uh, Kiev and north of it for one month, and there was never any kind of terrorist attack. It just it never happened, right? In the Kharkov area, and in Sumy, where they stayed, well, in Sumy, they stayed a little bit longer than uh, Kiev, but not much longer, only about a week longer or four or five days longer. Again, this is an area that tends to be more pro-Ukrainian. It didn't happen. Around the Kharkov area, which is more of a mixed bag, it didn't happen, right? Um, it did happen in areas that are primarily Russian, but those are people who are being sent into those areas to do that kind of thing. And again, it was never in the numbers, like at the end of the day, um, you know, there were only about eight people maybe that were killed this way. It's, it's just not significant enough in the course of six months, right? Because the last two months, November and October, and almost all of September, I have never, I have never seen one of these attacks. I've seen these attacks get foiled, but not succeeding. To put so the only way I can, I've heard hmm? more of these out of Syria in the past two months than I have out of Ukraine. Yes, yes. So, you know, some, some, some of the Russian uh, dudes on uh, Twitter were right about this. I think. Both Anatoly Karlin and um, Dmitry Orlov, and maybe the guys on Russians with Attitude, all of them said that this probably this is not going to happen in Ukraine. 
uh, that the cultures are too similar. Uh, the, the, the history is too shared no matter their animosity. And there's just, you know, there's just less likelihood. Again, unless Russia goes, let's say, to Odessa, where more of those tax can be facilitated, even though the, Odessa has like a large uh, Russian or Russian sympathetic population. Of course, many of them left after the reprisals that have been going on there since 2014 and you know the union building uh, murder of, of people who were burnt alive in that building and so on um it, that said though it is in an area that is kind of cut off from the the, the rest of ukraine that tends to be more pro-russian because everything to the north of it is like staunchly pro-ukrainian so, yeah, Odessa is the, the crossroads. Odessa is the is and has been since 2014 the contentious region. Yeah. And whether you will see Russia push in there, and because that was our speculation up until some more recent counteroffensives, that it was going to be a cutting off the coastline that would force this war to come to some sort of settlement. Now, whether that will happen now, I really can't say for sure, but. If there were to be any sort of insurgency or guerrilla warfare activity on the part of Ukraine, it would have to be in scenarios like that. It would have to be in these areas that are far more pro-Ukrainian. And even in somewhere like Kherson, which was probably the most pro-Ukrainian of the annexed territories, you didn't see that. And again, what you did see, you saw in very small numbers. So in terms of getting a gritty occupation where you create an Afghanistan or a Vietnam style situation it doesn't look like it's in the realm of any real possibility at least for the time being mm -hmm. but with that being said I do have a number of European news items if you are ready to get into those yeah so we will start with the news between the U.S. and France, so Macron has hosted Biden in order to <laughs> discuss the situation in Europe and discuss the current challenges that are being faced and will be faced in the coming months. So it starts out with a lovely state dinner with lobster and cheese served with none other than American Kraft cheese. This is <laughs> it's punishment. It's truly a sign of vassalage, <laughs> and it is a punishment for the insolence of France of all nations because Macron <laughs> had the role of playing that controlled opposition figure. Now, You'll have to eat our horrible cheese, <laughs> France. Like the the country known for great cheese, and they do have great cheese. <laughs> is forced to eat American cheese. <laughs> Truly has fallen Hi. far from the days of glory. This is what happens when yeah. you are at the uh, at, at the forefront of two world wars. This is what happens when you are a civilizational driving force that has expended its lifespan, really. And I, I don't say this out of any animus for the French. In fact, I actually have a little bit of a soft spot in yeah. my heart for the French. And I say this more out of pity, but the scenario is... Uh, it, it's very telling. It does show that... Despite the growing weaknesses of the American Empire, it still does have weight to throw around. And this is probably one of the greatest soft power moves I have seen in uh, the past few years at least. Uh, having lobsters and cheese <laughs> with craft cheese. I think, yeah. the, I think the only thing... No, we, should, we should tell the audience that it wasn't craft cheese. It was Monterey Jack. No. <laughs> uh, but I, I think the only thing that would have been worse... We're was, teasing. With, we're with, teasing. The, our, our, we're going to lose our American listeners. Uh, uh, we haven't already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really not sure who the target audience for the show is anymore. I appreciate all of you, all of you sticking around, but... I don't, I don't know. I don't really think we have a target demographic at this point, but we're getting <laughs> we're we're getting too caught up in minutiae. But the last thing I'll say is the only thing that could have made this more insulting is it was Velveeta, and that's the last word I have to say <laughs> about the state dinner. <laughs> now, uh, there was this very awkward moment where Biden would not let go of Macron's hand, and 
Macron is looking around like someone <laughs> saved me. <laughs> Biden is in one of those dazed uh, uh, states of being that he is when he finishes a speech. You know, when he doesn't know where to go and he seems completely dazed, except he was stationary and just gripping Macron's hand. It was it was very bizarre. But there was also I an mean, interesting a, photo in all of that where mm. it was Macron and his wife, who is, once again, significantly older than him, with Joe Biden and his wife, where Macron is, like, noticeably younger than everyone at the table. <laughs> it looks like it looks like a man who's out with, like, it, it, his, <laughs> his grandparents and his aunts and uncles rather than, like, a man, <laughs> but rather than two couples at dinner. And that was, uh, to, to focus more on the minutiae, that was also a very entertaining uh, photo at the very least. But aside from... That Biden gap. Everything I've seen from this meeting is more or less standard, pretty uneventful, and there wasn't any real great diplomatic breakthroughs. Not that I would have expected any, but it is just business as usual. You had Macron fly Biden out across the Atlantic to assure the confidence of Europe going in the winter because Europe has never been more united. NATO has never been never. more united. And yeah. of course, this is all in the backdrop of the current oil and gas price cap that they're trying to establish and the further European Union actions against Russian energy. So they're attempting there is a it does go ahead, it does go coincide it does coincide with uh, Biden's uh, inflation act. So there's a clause in it where he's going to help uh, all these European companies that are finding energy prices way too high. Uh, to move to the States. That's interesting because before Macron flew to Washington, uh, he made, like days before, uh, made claims, uh, which are true, that Europe is paying far too much uh, for their energy needs in the gas and oil that America is supplying to them, and that this is not good. That I didn't see uh, addressed at all. I could be wrong. If somebody knows, please tell me. But I saw no ad uh, address of that whatsoever. Essentially, the meeting basically marks the point where Macron, like Schultz, all of them have accepted that Europe is finished. Europe is uh, the 51st state of the US. Uh, it will be a financialized economy. It will lose all its industry. Uh, and that's the price of uh, America's desire not to have, under any circumstances, uh, a fruitful relationship between Europe and Russia uh, at any cost. Well, and I think the 51st state is actually a very good analogy because most people improperly use it, but it works with the European Union because, much like the other 50 states, it will not get any help from the American federal government. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> so it it, coinc it coincides with that, and um, it, it, you know they um, they were they were asked if uh, Biden is going to speak. The press asked him if he was going to speak with Putin, and he said, "Yes, we're uh, open to dialogue." Uh, you know, basically as soon as uh, Putin removes all his troops from Ukraine, as which soon is a total non-starter. As soon as all of our conditions are met, we can negotiate the American style yeah, of diplomacy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you can tell, like um, some people say that, uh, you know, America has given up on uh, regime change in Russia. But statements like that are essentially saying we're still hoping for a regime change in Russia, because if Putin ever agreed with that, there would be regime change in Russia. Uh, it might take a year, it might take six months, it might take six weeks. I don't know, but it would happen. Um, Macron said that he would speak to him, uh, to Putin. Uh, whatever good that's going to do. And Peskov, uh, one of Putin's secretaries, said, uh, well, actually, we don't have Macron lined up for any conversation, so I don't know what Macron is talking about. Essentially, that's what he said, uh, which was another sort of womp womp moment for Macron. And the trend you'll notice as Macron came into office and as Merkel left office, the West has always had somebody appointed that they send in to talk to Putin, especially post-2014. For the longest time, that was mm -hmm. Merkel, that was Germany, but that torch has been passed to France, where although no real conversations of any meaning happen, although no real progress is made between the two blocs, 
it's somebody they can send over there as a formality. It's somebody that they can have place that phone call as a formality. And Macron has taken up this role since at least 2019. It really came to shine in 2020. There was even some token amounts of cooperation on the situation in Libya, as I'm sure you'll recall. And it did look like, and perhaps this is just my naivete at the time, that there was a real possibility, at least some degree of reconciliation between the West and Russia, at least on particular issues. But that has yeah. all completely collapsed. That has all completely fallen apart. In actually, light of the Belarus protest is what undid a lot of that progress that was happening between France and Russia over the summer of 2020. And then, of course, that spills over into you, the tensions building in Ukraine, spills over into the actual conflict in Ukraine, to the point where, once again, it has become a formality. It's become something they can say, well, at least we tried to negotiate before they tried to implement whatever drastic measure that they want to, such as this oil and gas cap that is trying to cap at least oil at $60 a barrel. Russia said that they're going to refuse to go along with this, and of course, there are other buyers for Russian oil. In fact, you had the U.S. State Department say, well, it's completely okay that Pakistan is buying Russian oil. So, <laughs> while the European market isn't insignificant to Russia, it isn't the... It's not going to make it's, or break Russia. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, exactly, it's not going to make or break Russia. It's not the cash cow for Russia, especially when you have increased cooperation with China over this week, when you have the deals with India, when you have the several deals that they've been making with several non-Western nations a across the world. Now you can say, well, those nations, they don't have the same sort of economic or cultural political power that the West has. Well, point being is, the Russian oil and gas is still selling at the same rate it was before the war. It's actually gotten up to those levels. The ruble is at strength that we have not seen it in, in years because of this. The influence of the petrodollar is retreating, and that even gets into OPEC, which is threatening to cut production yet again at this time, despite requests from the U.S., of course, to increase production. You have OPEC once again moving with other oil-producing states that are not part of OPEC, but working with OPEC, OPEC Plus as they're calling it, to cut production back yet again. And the first time we saw this, this was... Mohammed bin Salman more or less testing the waters. Of course, him being the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, he effectively rules the country. He's a very influential figure there. He has done a lot of cleaning house there and set himself up for a complete assumption of power once his, I believe, the blood relation is actually, King Salman is actually his uncle rather than his father because just how convoluted the Saudi political system is. Uh, so <laughs> when, once he fully assumes power, that will be in place. But we're seeing, rather than Mohammed bin Salman actually testing the waters, the entirety of OPEC starting to move in a concerted effort, behaving like the cartel that it, it honestly is, and moving to cut production even further. Now, this is also at a time when the U.S. has released more than strategic reserves. I'm sure you've all noticed that national gas prices have been down. They appease the American populace, at least for the travel on the holiday weekend, They'll probably try to keep that through to the end of the year because, of course, you still have the Christmas holiday that people will be traveling on. And they're probably really trying to stave this off until 2023. And just as sheer political maneuvers, when the Republicans assume office at the beginning of 2023, when they take their slight majority in the House, they're probably going to start reneging all these things and play the partisan game. Well, look, gas prices were on a decline when we were in power, but now that the Republicans have assumed office and take control of the House... They're back on an incline, so playing once again into that party politics narrative that I'm sure we're all too familiar with. But moving on with that, there is some degree of sane news out of Europe, and you guessed it, Hungary, where Hungary has <laughs> said that they, uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister has said that Hungary is responsible for a Ukrainian delegation not being able to attend the recent NATO meetings. Hungary has stonewalled that, as I'm sure none of you are surprised. Hungary has continued its dedication to receiving Russian energy and that they are going to fight against the price cap at this time, which has been a consistent policy, and that he's trying to extend exceptions to the Russian energy 
that is being received by Hungary despite this. Now, this is on top of the current dynamic between Hungary, the EU, and NATO, where they agreed to sign on to Finnish and Swedish membership, but they're going to delay that until 2023. As we discussed last time, that's something that can be perpetually delayed, and that's something that can a candidate can be kicked down the road. Something that isn't really a statement of support rather than a statement of compliance. You have the EU threatening to freeze Hungarian funds and redirect them. You actually already saw that being implemented to a degree. And when it comes to the EU funds, when it comes to Ukraine, actually, the Russian assets that are frozen, they're are attempting to unfreeze those in order to participate in the reconstruction of Ukraine. They're already talking about reconstruction when this yeah. war has no end in sight. And... <laughs> and it's so ludicrous. I mean, I, I think... I, I wish I remember who said this so I could give them credit, that the Russians in Kiev is about as a distant thought as the Ukrainians are in Crimea, where it's a complete frozen conflict right now that we are nowhere close to the end and they're already trying to discuss means of of reconstruction with Russian funds, no less. Now, I'm sure when this war broke out that they, of course, anticipate that their funds would be frozen and likely used against them. So we'll see how that turns out. Will Russia ever get that money back? I doubt it. Will the Ru- the Russian people have their money in these European? <laughs> you countries? know, I have a theory about no, that. No, okay, do go ahead. I think, I think, I I think Russia intentionally left the money. It's a it's a kind of bait. If the Europeans, or rather the Americans, decide to take the money, then that will send a signal to every other country that they will just whatever they'll make up laws on the spot. In order to take uh, the money, uh, you've seen it. You've seen them do it to smaller countries. Well, they can do it to bigger countries, right? So that's one scenario. Number two, it's a kind of backroom deal. I know you're going to take it. Maybe I can give you uh, the the go ahead. Maybe we can work it out. You know, when you rec- when we agreed that Ukraine must never be part of NATO. And that you have to understand that southern and eastern Ukraine with Crimea are part of Russia. You know, here's here's half the money you're going to need to reconstruct uh, Ukraine. I I always thought like it was a, a dumb thing, it, 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 like. Yeah, R- Russia's done some dumb things, but this is just too beyond the pale. I don't believe that this was something that they just didn't think about. At the very least, it was a sacrifice they were willing to make. Yeah, I I, I think it was intentional. I really do. In, in, uh, in hindsight, I think, and I've been thinking this for months and months. And um, every time the topic has been uh, broached, as it has been these last few days, um, I thought about it again, and I have to say, uh, I think Russia left the money there intentionally. It's um, to, to put the the West in a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't moment, right? Like they they want it, but they know that if they take it, to some degree, the reputation will be tarnished. It will make all the other countries now that the West desperately needs to be on their side weary. Right. Because, of course, you know, American power is still like largely soft power. And all these countries are aware of of the, you know, particularly from the Internet, which is dominated by American culture, uh, how easily they can influence um, said countries. So I think it was intentional. I think it's a bargain uh, that, that Russia is playing. I, I do. R- Russia, uh, I think, has always known that this war was inevitable. And uh, they did a lot of very careful preparation, like, uh, you know, creating the mirror card uh, that foresaw the kind of heavy, heavy sanctions that would be placed on them that far exceed uh, 2014. 
which already did a number on them back then. But they, in about two or three years, they recovered. In any case, um, I think that's what it is. I think it's uh, I think it's a bargaining ploy and a bit of a trap at the same time. I, I would I would certainly agree. And uh, now that you had brought up the sanctions package, to continue on with some of the news out of Hungary trying to get some sort of exception or delay to the sanctions package. Now, thus far, you've seen targeting of Russian oil and gas, but they haven't touched any cooperation when it comes to the nuclear sector. This is different this time. And it's possible that if these go through, 18 countries in Europe that include Finland, Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Czech Republic would be affected by this as their reactors rely on Rosatom for their supply of nuclear fuel and other services. So many people, and I would say rightfully so, have criticized Germany for its dismantlement of its nuclear plant, but they have treated it as a catch-all solution, as something that would be the just end-all and be-all of the energy crisis that if Germany just had not decommissioned the nuclear plants, that they would be just fine this winter. Well, we're starting to see the potential of this situation being affected now that even countries such as France and such as the aforementioned that do rely on nuclear energy can very easily have that threatened because Russia is the second largest source of uranium that the European imported from, at least before the war started. Nigeria was the only country that beat it out, and that's primarily because of their relationship with France. But you're seeing this right now play in, and and it does dispel a lot of, let's just say, the high hopes that were given to nuclear energy. But the energy crisis, once again, goes beyond just the oil and gas, and this goes to a variety of raw resources, which we've discussed in the past as well. <laughs> so to continue on with just a bit of European news, uh, speaking of sanctions, the European Union has said to Serbia that it will refuse to move forward with any EU ascension unless Serbia participates in the sanctions package, which <laughs> at that rate, like, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know who is still under the illusion that Serbia is a viable EU candidate, is what I'm getting at here. Or any of the a, It could be a viable anti-Russia candidate, and that's the, only, that's the only prerequisite for joining the EU now. Anyways, I mean, it has been forever. It's just the Damascus in 2022. Yes, and getting into some more Balkan news, this one is probably very near and dear to your heart, that <laughs> you have the various Soros-aligned, quote-unquote, non-profits have closed their doors in Macedonia and have relocated to Kosovo and Albania. In which case, you're seeing a full Soros endorsement of Greater Albania <laughs> as uh, some were joking, but you've had... Thank you, USA. <laughs> You are my best friend. <laughs> you are my best friend. But you've had Macedonia as a forefront of a lot of these NGO activities for the past oh, yeah. decade, at least. And you've you've gotten in detail about this. You told me you've told, in fact, the audience uh, some of the stories about when you actually went there and how things had changed. Yeah. But given the circumstances and given the situation in Albania right now, as I'm sure you all know, there's also the whole migration crisis that involves them trying to cross into Britain right now, that they've completely pulled funds from Macedonia. Now, as far as I know, perhaps you would know more, there's been no major change in there that I think would have ended up uh, leading to an action like that, unless they're going all in on the Albanian minority in Macedonia at this time and trying to use them as just a complete wedge and just operating out of both Kosovo and Albania at this time. But I see no real rationale for this move at the time, so perhaps you have a bit more insight on that? I, I honestly, uh, I, I've not been following it. Um, I don't know what the reasoning is. I strongly doubt that there is a, um, uh, a, a contentious uh, group in Macedonian elites that uh, is Russian-backed and is uh, 
confronting this, you know, the Soros U.S. Um, faction. I, 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 I it just, it's, it's not there. Um, Macedonia is a lower priority for, for Russia than Serbia is. And um, it's, um, even though the, like, the biggest trading partner for Serbia is Macedonia and vice versa for, for Macedonia, um, the fact of the matter is there's just not... I, I, I don't know what the reasoning for it would be. Uh, maybe Macedonia is just like too poor or um, Kosovo is probably uh, an, an area that that is more of a concern for Soros. You know, that would imply that maybe resources are being stretched and it would make sense to put in all the resources in uh, Albania and Kosovo because let's face it, like if there's going to be a second front, it's not going to be Taiwan. It's, uh, it's going to be somewhere else in Europe. And maybe the Albanians are going to play a role in that. So it could be Kosovo. Those could be some of the reasons. I would say, yeah, that makes the most sense that I don't think we're seeing any sort of resurgence of any semblance of sanity in Macedonia and that it's likely just a, a business decision, which I, I suppose is slightly encouraging that Soros might be having to pick and choose what operations he continues, that he's not infinitely wealthy, that he does have to play by some constraints. But although it did catch my interest, I wouldn't read too much into the story. Mm -hmm. But continuing on with that, you do have also Biden saying to Europe at this time, regarding the energy situation, that the U.S. intends to work closely with Europe in helping it diversify its energy resources, and that the U.S. is assisting Europe in diversifying its energy resources and abandoning Russian natural gas in the near future. So they do continue this push. I'm sure you all recall Blinken's statements after the Nord Stream incident saying, well, this is a great opportunity for Europe to uh, diversify its <laughs> energy source. And, and they've made these statements since the beginning of the war. They've made these statements since any, yeah. uh, since <laughs> any, any time any hiccup happens. What a humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> you have these vultures weighing the wings, usually Blinken, usually somebody associated with them, but they brought up Biden himself to say at this time to say to, to coax them away from Russian energy as if there's really a viable alternative at this point, as if American energy production is enough to sustain Europe. Even back when we were having the energy boom, there wasn't the ports to receive it. But ultimately what this means, if you actually read into the text, it means buying oil and gas from places like Tunisia, Egypt, and India, which are buying it from Russia. It means just going through third parties effectively, yeah. because that's the only way to get the energy output that Europe would need if it wants to stay a competitive industrial block, in which case I think that's gone out the window. I don't really see that returning in time in the near future. And as, as you had brought up with the Biden-Macron meeting, that you have Biden incentivizing these European firms to move to the States, and that you also have plenty of them moving to China as well. Now, given also the state of the energy crisis, we do have a bit of news out of Germany as well, that Germany is receiving about 45% of its electricity at this point from coal plants, and that is after That's staggering. their push for wind energy has more or less stalled out. And of course, that does have to do with weather patterns. And that's after Nord Stream is demolished and the nuclear plants are decommissioned, that you have Germany returning to a coal economy. Now, I'm not going to knock any country for using coal. I have, I, I wouldn't call my position necessarily pro quote-unquote fossil fuel but i have a much less harsh opinion on fossil fuel than a lot of people even in these circles let's put it that way my personal bias is just completely out on the table but it does harken back to a much 
younger or much more, for lack of a better word, primitive, much less advanced economy that you have them producing about 45% of their energy on coal. This is reminiscent of the early to mid 20th century that they have so much. Once again, it's a reliable energy resource. It does do the job. Now, out of all the fossil fuels, quote-unquote, I do think it does carry the most environmental concerns, especially compared to something like natural gas. And it, I will say that in order to get this, they've also had to demolish large parts of the Black Forest and other very pristine nature sites. So it doesn't come without its drawbacks. And I'm not saying Germany mm-hmm. should be a coal-powered economy, I not by any means, but I do think... As you said, it's staggering that any economy, any quote-unquote first world economy in the 21st century being that reliant on coal power. I mean, the U.S. Is, has a lot of coal power, but we're also a major coal producer, and it has been a stable industry, once again, since the late 19th, early 20th century. And you've actually seen states, parts of the states move away from that. In fact, interesting fact, I mean, West Virginia, which is known as the heart of coal country, has, I mean, th- of course, there's still coal production going on there, but they've moved more towards natural gas and geothermal energy. And that's where, that's the bo- those are the booming industries right now over the coal industry. So even in the heart of coal country, not only in America, but you could think the world at large so sort of exemplifies the coal mines is, is that region of Appalachia that stretches in eastern Kentucky through Virginia, West Virginia, etc. Even they at this point, are less reliant on coal than, than Germany. And Germany, rightfully until recently, had the reputation of being this industrial economic powerhouse of Europe, and that it has been reduced to this. And feeling the consequences of the Nord Stream pipeline, which was a story that was completely so under the rug, nobody talks about that anymore, it's going to be mm-hmm. that way for the foreseeable future. Even if they can recommission their nuclear plants, which I do think is honestly a good idea. I have nothing really against nuclear energy. I, I've said before, I do think people are far too optimistic about it, but I have no problem with it uh, just functionally. Even that's not going to be enough. And Europe is going to need oil and it's going to be nat- need natural gas, not only for energy resources, but for other parts of industry as well and for other products as well. I mean, think about how many petroleum products there are. And where else are they going to get it? Like I said, the only realistic option they have, which is which puts them in a position where they're getting completely taken advantage of by these nations because of the current policy, is they have to buy it from middlemen like India, like Tunisia, like Egypt, and other countries will probably get in on this market. And I believe even Saudi Arabia, which is a massive energy producer in and of itself, was getting in on this market as well, where they were buying Russian oil and reselling it at a higher price. So, not only have you not broken your alliance on Russian energy, which has been the purported goal of all of this, you're paying more for it than you originally would have if nothing ever happened. Yeah. Um, You know, part of the... Part of this uh, price cap, uh, on the face of it, doesn't make any sense, right? Because, like, a $60 price cap uh, is not far off from, like, where Russia is selling oil now anyways, right? Like, it's selling it for $70 a barrel, depending on which countries you're talking about. And, of course, I mean, trade with China has, over energy, is, like, nearly it's uh, it's more than doubled and uh china does not buy any energy from uh you know from russia using the american dollar anymore that's over uh but russia we don't know for sure but russia is selling oil at a discount rate less than last year but profits have been higher and I guess what they're trying to do is to get like little countries that might be getting it, uh, that might be paying a little more uh, to not pay as much. So when they mix it or like they go somewhere in the ocean and they mix up the oil, because, you know, there's all kinds of like black market stuff that's going to that's been happening since 
day one, since the since the very first uh, sanctioned packages against Russian oil and gas. Okay, so I think that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to get like smaller countries that are in on this. But I mean, I think it's fruitless, right? Like, uh, you know, Russia is uh, Russia is already giving it, it, the biggest buyers of Russian energy already are getting a, a good deal and they're not going to go along with this. Right. It's th th this is very much a symbolic act. You know. It, it's not going to make any. Yeah, difference. it's not not at all. It's. It, it, as you said, symbolic. There's really no better way to put this. And I just do have one last piece of European news, which are the strange packages that were sent to Madrid, oh. and, among other embassies across Europe, where allegedly what were in these packages were uh, parts of, of animals, such as eyes and uh, other things, as well as... Suspected explosives. I know the U.S. Uh, security forces actually had a controlled demolition of one of those uh, suspected explosives where you're getting these in several... I mean, Madrid was the main one. In Spain, it, it was the main one. And yeah, they attacked the embassy, and then another letter with explosives showed up at a manufacturing company or corporation in, in Spain. Separate from the Ukrainian embassy, which happened first. And nobody has really been able to piece together what exactly happened here. In fact, these stories disappeared about as fast as they came up. Some speculated that this was going to be the next big push for some sort of false flag or for some sort of new narrative. But it doesn't look like they've gone in that direction, as we discussed with the last time something like this happened with the missile story, that when they plan these things out, they're almost always on top of them. They have a narrative concoction. They have something ready to put out there almost immediately. Where, for example, in a situation where they don't have something prepared, they sit on the missile story for five hours before coming up with what they're even going to put out there. So that is ultimately not surprising. And again, I bring these, this story up because developing... Maybe there'll be more to cover on next episode, but I can't tell you much more than it happened because there's information is almost non-existent about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was really weird. The animal eyes thing is so bizarre. Uh, the Ukrainian embassies in the Netherlands, Croatia... Poland and Hungary all got these things. Like that's not one person doing it. Like, and in in my opinion, I mean, it could be, but it's it's completely bizarre. Like I said, I I have no idea what to make of it at this time. I'm just telling you that it is a developing story, and that if we do have more information in the future, we'll be certain to follow up on this. But also, if you have any information about it, uh, please let me know because I would like to look into this further and actually have something a bit more substantive to talk about when it comes to the story on future episodes. But with that being said, I do have a few pieces of Central Asian news if you don't have any uh, other European news. No, I'm good. So we have first news out of Kyrgyzstan, which has balked on the Russian mirror system and mm -hmm. has banned it under the threat of U.S. sanctions. Which isn't surprising that these smaller countries on the periphery will fall victim to that, as we were discussing earlier. Then you have what does seem to signal further cooperation between Kazakhstan and Russia, which is not a guarantee in these times, as we've seen since the beginning of this year, when you had the attempt at the color revolution in Kazakhstan, when you had them try to pass these language laws and say that they were going to try to phase out the Russian language. And, of course there is still a large Russian minority that is in Kazakhstan. Now, it has been decreasing every year since the fall of the Soviet Union. You have a large amount of emigration from there. But then you have their meetings with the U.S. and their negotiations with the U.S. at this time, which lended credence to Kazakhstan being possibly the second front in all of this. But they have come out recently, and they have 
uh, further cooperation with Russia on the areas of security and energy. So that isn't surprising, but I will still advise everyone who does watch the show that keep your eye there because it is probably going to be the center of another major story in the next few months here. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they're trying to push. That, the Caucasus, and the Balkans, I think are going to be the Mm -hmm. three big contenders if they want to divide Russia's attention. Perhaps they'll do all three. Perhaps they'll do a combination of them. Perhaps they'll do one of them. But if you're looking for anything to divide Russia's attention, it's going to be found in one of those three areas. And Kazakhstan being such a large country, once again, a large uranium producer, we were just discussing the dynamics between Europe and Russia when it came to nuclear energy and Europe's reliance on uranium imports. If Kazakhstan does have even... A, a slight tilt to the West, even if it does have a more conciliatory view towards the West, it could become a solution for that for Europe. So they certainly are one of the larger targets, even more so than something like the Caucasus, because the Caucasus can be peripheral. The Balkans, once again, that is, with especially with Serbia, Russia's real blast outlet outside in Europe, outside of the former Soviet Union, But I would suspect if they're going to try anything anywhere that Kazakhstan would be the grand prize, which means they would either do that immediately or hold it off as long as they can, and time will tell. Even though I... Depending on how the situation in Ukraine goes, I will say, if it does start to look like coming into Russia's favor over the course of the winter, if there is a major winter offensive like many people are speculating, I believe Kazakhstan will be the second front that they try to open up. Yeah, that's very likely. I, I kind of my my take on, on Kyrgyzstan, right? Now they have they have been able to apply pressure. Some of the Turkish banks have refused the, the Mir card, for instance. Um my guess is what they really want is uh Kazakhstan. And that going after Kyrgyzstan is trying to create a domino effect because they didn't get Kazakhstan. Now last week there were some protests again, but they were very small. And Takayev actually flew to Moscow uh, to discuss creating like an energy hub um, that would supply energy to China ostensibly, but to uh, work in tandem with other Central Asian countries. And I mean, it sounded like it was, you know, cold but conciliatory. And uh, that, uh, you know, this is a way to sort of, at least economically, if not culturally, to uh, push the country forward. Now, the the Kazakhs have been sort of radicalized uh, to a degree. Uh, A lot of Russians have left, so there's much less Russian influence. There is a George Soros University in Kazakhstan. Uh, There is a lot of American companies and a lot of American influence there. The CIA is there. Um, Russia depends on them. Uh, No less than three military satellites in the last two weeks have been launched from Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan is a major priority. And my guess is America didn't get what it wanted in Kazakhstan, so they focused on Kyrgyzstan. Is a kind of a warning to Kazakhstan. And also keep in mind, but I just don't think that the, the, this. Within, I don't think there's enough American influence there yet. That could change in six months, but I'm just saying, not at the moment. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, it is picking off the smaller ones while they can in attempts to build momentum to take on a project like Kazakhstan. But also with Kyrgyzstan, you do have to remember that they did have that skirmish, that short-lived skirmish with Tajikistan over the border. Mm. Now, that isn't the first time something like that has happened, and it does make you wonder if if that will continue. To my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, Tajikistan is far more Russia-aligned than Kyrgyzstan is. Yeah, Tajikistan is like, they speak a form of Farsi. When I was was in Moscow in 2018, I actually met a guy uh, who was studying to become a dentist. Like, literally one of the nicest people I ever met. And, um, yeah, he's from Tajikistan. Kyrgyzstan is, like, far more Asiatic. They look more like Kazakhs. I wonder if the reason they did that is for trade. That might be going um, 
to China vis-a-vis -vis Kyrgyzstan from uh, from Kazakhstan. Uh, I, I wonder if that's the case. In any case, uh, trade between Russia and Kazakhstan has also increased, right? Yes, and some people speculate that that's going to be a sticking point in the future between Russia and China. Well, they do have their arguments. I still don't see at this time where that would develop anywhere in the near future, especially given the current circumstances with everything else going on. But Central Asia, and again, they've been trying to pick away at Central Asia since the fall of the Soviet Union. I remember there were these grandiose Pakistani plans to create a Central Asian bloc under their leadership in the wake of the collapse <laughs> of the Soviet Union with American support. But, of course, that didn't pan out. But you do have the potential there, and I would say probably more so than the Caucasus for a significant flare-up there, although the situation immediately is more contentious between Armenia and Azerbaijan when it comes to the consequences on a global scale, Central Asia is going to be a far more important theater, and they have to pick which one they're going to dedicate their focus to. They're going to focus on Kazakhstan, they're going to focus on these other Central Asian countries, especially in light of the loss in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. I mean, in many ways, Afghanistan makes no sense that they 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 never developed it economically, right? Um, I mean, it's not like they didn't build some infrastructure. I'm just saying, considering where uh, the economies were going, uh, the digitization of the economy, uh, and the importance of batteries, which you cannot say the Americans were caught sleeping. They're very well aware of it, including, for instance, uh, you know, with Macron's visit to the U.S., this basically seals the deal that automakers in Europe are going to be moving to the U.S. to design and manufacture electric cars, right? So they had to have known this. And my guess is the reason they never built up Afghanistan is because if they did it would force integration with the rest of Central Asia that they did not have control over. It would not profit them. So it was a holding mechanism. Uh, in the same way that British policy in Canada was not to develop Canada for as long as possible, to delay it, because infrastructure development in Canada would entail economic cooperation with America, which eventually would mean greater American cultural influence upon Canada. And I think something like that, uh, some kind of rationale like that was being used in Afghanistan. Yes, especially given the circumstances of Afghanistan. And even when you look at the first Taliban government in the 1990s up until 2001, even they were on the brink of reaching some sort of agreement with China. And while U.S.-Chinese relations were much better in the early 2000s, it certainly wasn't a friendly relationship or nowhere even close to anything that could be considered an alliance. But at that point, developing Afghanistan would have been creating a country that would be cooperative with either China or the former Soviet bloc in Central Asia, which was undesirable. And perhaps that was the goal of the Afghanistan war, was to destabilize Afghanistan as much as possible to make that those crossroads impassable, both in a figurative and literal sense. But even with that, you see further Chinese encroachment into Afghanistan and further Chinese deals with the current Taliban government to assist in the development of the country. So I guess you could say that was all for naught, which, I mean, uh, that, that shouldn't shock anyone who has any knowledge of the American Empire and how it functions mm -hmm. and its history. But that's all I have for Central Asia. I do have some Middle Eastern news to get into as well, if you have any other news items on Central Asia. No, that's all I have for now. Okay, so you have probably one of the more active weeks in Syria within the past few months and arguably all year. So you have Turkey beginning Operation Claw Sword in uh, you got to love these operation names, in northeastern Syria against the Kurdish forces. 
And this was the one that was given tacit U.S. approval where they said, of course Turkey has the right to operate against these groups which present a legitimate threat on the southern border. So you have them pushing further into Iraqi Kurdistan and northern Iraq and northeastern Syria with the large Kurdish presence. And this also coincides with Russia requesting that Kurdish militias withdraw from 30 kilometers from the border as well. So you're seeing this tacit approval of a Turkish incursion into Syria. Everyone is eager to keep Turkey on its good side. And Erdogan is looking yet again for another victory, especially given the situation with the Kurds and the potential future threat that presents not only against him, but Turkey's position as a whole. And you, this also comes on top of decreased U.S. patrols with the Kurdish forces in northeast Syria. And that actually led to a cascading effect where the Kurdish forces in Syria agreed to halt their operation against ISIS in cooperation with the U.S. So you're seeing a severing of U.S.-Kurdish ties from the Kurdish side. Because there's always been this back and forth, as we discussed previously, of the U.S. propping up the Kurds, pulling back from them, propping them up for them, pulling back from them. It does seem like after 30 years, 30 more than 30 years at this point, that there does seem to be some sort of lesson learned on the part of the Kurdish forces, at least in Syria. And this also follows the order for evacuation of U.S. civilian personnel, including diplomats from northeast Syria, to Erbil in Iraq in anticipation of further escalations in northeastern Syria. So, I don't know to what extent these operations will be carried out, or how far Erdogan will take this, or how actually serious he is about this, how much this is an actual operation versus the political stunt. But it does signal, especially with the evacuation of U.S. civilian and diplomatic personnel to Iraq, and giving their tacit approval to Turkey to conduct this operation, that they're running up the white flag on Syria. And I don't really know any other way to interpret it. Perhaps they have some sort of other back channel, perhaps those rebels along the Jordanian border are going to be their ace in the hole to keep Syria destabilized. Now, of course, that is a major pocket in Syria that is going to be a thorn in the side of the government in Damascus, but certainly not enough to completely destabilize the country. But it does seem that on top of throwing a bone to Turkey, which the U.S. is all too desperate to do at this time, that they're hoping a Turkish operation in Syria will undo much of the diplomatic progress that has been made over the past few months between Turkey and Syria. That at least seems to be the aim of the American Empire at this point. Now, whether that will actually pan out, how much of a settlement can be reached between Turkey and Syria, especially with the cooperation of Russia, and even now that you have trade increasing between Turkey and Iran, they'll certainly have a role to play in it. You could see the return of those trilateral summits you saw in 2018 between Russia, Turkey, and Iran in order to discuss the process in Syria. But I can't imagine, given current circumstances, that the Turkish operations are going to be too extensive. Now, I could be wrong, but it does seem like an initial move. Hell, maybe it's to even just drive the American presence out of the region by saying, well, of course we'll stay here, but we have to be allowed to establish this foothold if you want our support in X, Y, or Z in the future. But it is probably the most consequential of all of this what, between Erdogan's operations and how much that is serious versus political maneuvering, uh, the effect on Syria, as well as the response of Iran and Russia. I would say the most definitive outcome of all of this is, I, I know this has been said many times by many different people, including us, but this is the largest U.S. withdrawal from Syria in both a military and non-military capacity that we've seen mm -hmm. since the beginning of the war. Um, uh, the, the, what I'm getting from, from Erdogan is, you know, back in July, early July, we thought he was going to go on this big offensive and it didn't happen. Now the, the looks of a, of a big offensive, 
uh, seems more convincing this time because of the air campaign. Uh, there have, of course, it, it, both Turkey, uh, the Kurds in Syria, the Kurds in Iraq and Syrian soldiers have died as a result of this. At least 15 Syrian soldiers were killed in a post that they shared with the Kurds. Um, the Kurds really, uh, I mean, these are also a, a, a stiff necked people. Uh, they're moronic. You know, they lost Afrin. Um, they're not really willing to work with the with with, with the Syrians. OK, uh, in, in many ways, they, too, are responsible for prolonging this war. And it is significant that the Americans are kind of abandoning abandoning them. The Russians have given the Turks a certain amount of caution, but also some carte blanche to do what they want. I think the Americans pulling out, there could be several reasons for this. It could be a theater that like they don't see advantage in, in holding it much longer. It could also be this, that the Americans expect the relationship between Russia and Turkey to sour. Uh, Erdogan has an election next year. And, um, I, you know, I think the Americans would love to see him not get elected. And if he didn't, it would certainly be a candidate that would be preferred by the Americans, would go along with their agenda. Uh, you know, Erdogan does not want Russia to conquer all of the seashore of Ukraine. Uh, he, 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 you know, he doesn't want Russia to be too successful in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, Russia, of course, controlling the Sea of Azov is extremely important, and they at least accomplished that uh, for, for trade reasons. Uh, Crimea is also incredibly important. Like 60% of their trade has flows through that area. That's that's why they really cannot let, uh, afford to let go of it. Uh, so is there a backroom deal that the Americans have with with uh, the, the, the Turks to sacrifice the Kurds? It, it's, it's also unbelievable to me that like that the Kurds like still believe like if you think Albanians believe in America, you you haven't seen anything else. There's nobody like the Kurds. And um, but w again, we'll have to wait and see uh, just how much of an incursion Erdogan is willing to do because you know he can't afford a, a defeat there, right? The Turks also, or even a costly uh, victory, especially this right. close to election. Right, right. And, and also, not, like, not only did the Turks not accept America's condolences over the terrorist attacks a few weeks ago, but they basically blamed the Americans. You know, they've said, oh, these are these people were, were trained in America. They're essentially saying America did this. They committed a terrorist attack on us. Right. So. That makes it maybe less likely that the Turks are going to um uh, turn their back on the russians you know there's also that energy hub that's that, that's happening turkey's economy needs all the help it can get uh an energy hub would greatly catapult um uh turkey to a more preeminent position on the other hand turkey loves having the possibility of nato defend it uh should it anger russia in some way i think russia had to offer uh, an economic benefit in order for Turkey to be able to stop, you know, NATO ships from 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 entering in greater numbers into the Black Sea, right? Um, so there is some cooperation there. Um, again, it's one of the one of those things. We're going to have to wait and see. I don't see a big land incursion at the moment. Maybe they're happy with the airstrikes. Um, maybe it will happen. We'll we'll just have to wait and see. 
Uh, but I think monitoring, like people talk about Russia and China relations going sour. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think a greater probability is that will happen with with Russia and Turkey. Oh, yes. Far rather, more contentious. rather than China and Russia. It's a far more contentious situation between Russia and Turkey, especially yeah. seeing as Erdogan's future in power is not a guarantee. Now, yeah. if I had to just say offhand, now the elections are a ways out, that he's probably going to get reelected, all things considered. But yeah, yeah. if he doesn't, almost certainly his opposition, whoever takes power, is not going to be nearly as conciliatory towards Russia as he is. Yes. Yes. Now, it could be one of those situations where just he's changed the landscape so much where Turkey does have to play that role. But again, when it comes to somebody even playing that middleman role, I don't see anyone nearly as conciliatory towards Russia as Erdogan coming to power in the near future. And especially with the Black Sea, with the Bosphorus Straits, and with even the situation in the Caucasus, there is very real potential, depending on who assumes power next year, that the situation between Turkey and Russia can turn very bad very quickly. And, I look, I'm not predicting outright war between the two at this point, but it can sour overnight, given the areas of tension between the two countries, whether that be in Libya, whether it be in the Caucasus, whether it be in Syria, whether that be even, hell, even over Ukraine and the Black Sea, that there are far too many flashpoints for, let's just say, a, a true firebrand to be in power. Now, Erdogan mm -hmm. has some firebrand mm -hmm. qualities, but it, there's far too many flashpoints for somebody who is, let's just say, a, a, a perfect NATO candidate. And even NATO might shy away at that point, depending on how they look in 2023, over somebody who might be that bold towards Russia. So, but, I mean, by no means they want Erdogan in power. So, it, it's it's a tough nut to crack, no matter what way you look at it. And the Turkish elections are going to be probably the most important in Europe out of any of the elections that are slated. Uh, insofar as Turkey's actually European, I, I know it's not technically, but it's going to be the most important election in NATO aligned countries over the course of the next year with no competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think Erdogan is like you say, is probably going to get elected. Um, the chance to, I mean, even before the coup uh, in 2016, the, the chance to oust Erdogan, I think, already passed sometime in 2016, 2015. You had, like, all those screeching Turkish feminists in the streets of, you know, Soros-paid uh, Soros protesters and, like, all the classic, classic color revolution stuff, right? And it didn't happen. And in many ways, like he outmaneuvered Gulen and all those guys by going even more religious. Um, and it worked out for him. Um, like the only the only weak point really is the economy. And by him going along with, you know, Russia's energy hub deal for for Europe, which really is a back channel for Europe to get like some kind of energy. So it's not totally dependent on the U S and it remains to be seen what the U S will do. Um, that in and of itself is pretty promising. It makes the case for the way Erdogan has steered the country for the last six, seven years. Right. Because, I, uh, you know, America in Turkey is not popular. Right. Like Turks humiliate and insult um, American military personnel in the streets there. Like they're, they're not appreciated. They're not liked. Um, it's never been a they, they kind of like relationship, it. but even compared to then, it's it's gotten markedly worse. Let's put it that way. Yes. Uh, you know, you remember like about what was it, three or four years ago, there were those videos of 
like American military, they might have been sailors and they're being harassed in Istanbul and they're being insulted. There's about three of them. Like it's not, you, you know, it, it, we're not living in, uh, you know, the 1950s or 1960s. You know, the, the, the people don't feel that way about America anymore. Well, another example is remember when Erdogan sent his... Unless they're Kurds or Albanians. <laughs> when Erdogan sent his security forces in D.C. to attack pro-Kurdish protesters. I mean, there's also instances yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, oh, that brawl. Oh, yeah. my God. That was crazy. Good memory. Yeah, yeah, there's instances like that, and not that, once again, the U.S. and Turkey have ever had a warm relationship. It's always been a very pragmatic one. It's grown even colder in recent years, especially since the coup, even before the coup. And at, at this point, it's it's a very delicate situation, which gives Turkey a lot of bargaining power between both the U.S. and Russia. But speaking of the U.S., I do have some brief American news. Hmm. So, given the current situation in the U.S., just some basic economic figures now. This is from Zero Hedge, so I do take it with a bit of a grain of salt. So, over the course of the past year, the U.S. has lost about 100,000 manufacturing jobs. And in terms of professional and business jobs, about 77,000. In the financial sector, about 34,000. And in the information sector, about 25,000. But when it comes to service industry, bars, restaurants, etc., that's up about 224000 Now, I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone here that while, of course, there's nothing wrong with service industry jobs, they're not going to have the same benefits or the same pay or even be as just fulfilling at the end of the day as those much more real jobs in the business sector, in the financial sector, or in the manufacturing sector. And that it does continue to the the current state of the U.S. economy, where it becomes a much less set in stone, much less stable entity where you are bouncing around, where you are, you, you don't have the guaranteed nine to five where you have your fair day's pay and your health care and your vacation days. No, it's working for these very fickle establishment that have very high turnover rates when it comes to workers. And these are the jobs that are being produced right now. These are not the jobs that can really support people in any real sense. Sure, it can keep their heads above the water. It can keep their lights on. It can keep food on the table. But in terms of actual advancement in life, in terms of actually building a family or an actual livelihood, these are not the jobs that are going to do it. These are, once again, I I don't want to call them supplemental income because people do survive off of them, but they're not the kind of jobs that you're going to necessarily build a prosperous life on. Now, I'm sure you can point out examples or uh, or exceptions to that, but by and large, the kind of jobs that you need people to have a stable economy with are in those sectors that are all down, especially in the manufacturing sector, which is down the largest out of 100,000. Now, maybe with all those jobs coming over from Europe, that may give a temporary boon to that, but I still speculate, especially given the current state of, of the American energy shortages that are possible, that at what point does America's competitive edge dwindle? Because it does have it over Europe right now, even if it came from knocking Europe down a few pegs rather than raising the Europe up a few pegs. But it does make me wonder, even if we are importing a lot of these industrial sectors from Europe and importing a lot of these European companies, uh, what's the viability of that? Especially with such Mm. a major transfer when they're moving the bulk of their operations to not only a new country, but a new country across the Atlantic, how successful will they be here? I'm not saying they're going to be DOA or anything, but there's the real potential that they do take a major hit in business because of just the logistics of transferring such an operation. And the question is, how will this affect the U.S. job market? And... Will these jobs actually benefit the average American? What's the pay going to look like? What are the benefits going to look like? And because we don't know the details of this because it hasn't happened. And while it may provide a temporary boon, which I do predict that their goal is at least to drag this through 2024, 2025 in order to 
try to secure a re-election or secure some sort of transit of power that is favorable to them, whether they do try to rehabilitate Trump and make them and make him a full controlled opposition candidate, whether they find some Republican like DeSantis, whoever, who will play the game while serving as some sort of token opposition, whatever. But point being is they want to keep things stable, at least through the next election cycle, just to keep the political and social situation at bay in America. But those numbers, once again, do not bode well. And I doubt there's going to be any long-term improvement. Like I said, with some of the jobs that are being moved overseas in 2023 and onward, there may be some short-term improvement, but perhaps the pessimist in me, I don't see that lasting for any real amount of time or any sustainable amount of time either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, I mean, it remains to be seen just how much of, uh, you know, the green energy thing uh, takes off. Um, In many ways, because for America, because... It's more energy self-sufficient. Um, it's easier for it to make uh, that transition more painlessly. But if we're being honest, like, where is this transition? I mean, a few Tesla cars isn't the transition, right? It's not how a society changes completely. Now, they're saying by 2030, they want to accomplish this. Well, they've got seven years. And I mean, either something very dramatic is going to happen or it's not going to happen or it'll be delayed and kicked down the road, which would not be unusual. For Europe to make the decision, uh, the transition, um, you know, they would have to be forced into it. And again, just supplying Europe with like you know, BMW electric cars instead of just Tesla. Like, that's not, that's not enough. I mean, you need, like, the kind of carbon emissions that they want to, that they're boasting that they want to cut down is so immense. It would be like, I don't know, it would be, this this should be a gigantic project. And I I don't even think the Ukrainian war is enough uh, to... Um, start this on the right track. I, 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 I don't think it's appropriate enough of a platform to do that. And I do think it's interesting that you did bring up Tesla because they are the head of the industry when it comes to electric vehicles. That, of course, Tesla is an Elon Musk company. Now, I'm not saying Musk is some uh, a great man who is on our side on all issues, but he is a firebrand. He is somebody who is unreliably loyal to the establishment, for lack of a better term, that he's somebody yeah. who can't be counted on most of the time. And it, it, I would say he's really a coin flip's chance, depending on uh, how he behaves. Now, perhaps he can be brought in line. Perhaps they do have mechanisms, whether that be threatening him with actually enforcing regulations or whether they want to go more for the carrot approach, something that is much more beneficial to him, although he is one of the richest men, if not the richest man in the world. So it's a bit hard to give the carrot to somebody like that. So you could probably imagine they're going to go for the stick approach, but it, that does also prevent a contentious issue when the largest manufacturer of electric cars is somebody, let's just say, so fickle and unreliable that puts a- another wrench in that. And I'm glad you brought up the 2030 thing, because I think when a lot of people cite that figure, I mean, these were things that were going around in the early 2000s when that was 30 years away. Even in the 2010s, when it was 20 years away, that seemed more attainable. But now we're closing to the point where it's less than a decade away, and people are still pushing 2030 as this year of great change, whether it be the UN getting up there with their pie-in-the-sky ideas, whether that be the U.S. government, that they're all fixated on this 2030 date, that eventually they're either going to have to try to make drastic changes, or they're going to have to push this back, delay it, further degrading the credibility of themselves, which, um, for the record, I'm not saying is a bad thing at all, but... I, I really don't know their approach, and I'm not sure if they're going to go all in on it, if they're going to try to save face and save credibility and try to push something very drastic and stupid before 2030, or whether they're going to kick this can down the road. And I really think that does depend on the 2024 election, because perhaps, once again, they will let the opposition party, the quote-unquote opposition party, 
come to power and kick this can down the road and say, we're not doing this yet. This is unsustainable. We're going to go back to quote unquote business as usual and maybe push this agenda back to 2040 or 2045 or whatever. And I, I think that's their only realistic out at this point is letting somebody like a Trump or DeSantis in office in order to stymie that. So then not only do they have that extra breathing room that's been pushed back, and then they can also point the finger and blame it at the other side because they were unable to accomplish their goals in the time frame that they set. Because, of course, these numbers are never attainable. These dates that they set are never attainable. And at that rate, I do think they would let somebody like that, uh, quote-unquote, set them back, and it would frankly benefit them. Now, don't get me wrong. It, they, they would ease up on the pressure. They would let up on the gas because they would need to. But we wouldn't be free from this. And, of course, just as somebody who has to live day by day, as I'm sure we all do, it, it would be nice to experience, but it, it also is something that's going to lull people into a false sense of security thinking, oh, we've beat this, oh, Trump beat this, oh, DeSantis beat this, oh, who, you know, throw a name out there, ha- has beaten this, yeah. we pushed this back, and then lo and behold, the next guy in office, whatever, or whoever they dig up, is going to be pushing this even harder. And you actually saw this dynamic sort of established, I would say, starting with Obama, where Obama would get in, push these agendas, Trump gets in, pushes back against them, you have Biden gets in, who pushes these both further and harder than Obama did, and this is probably going to be the cycle they play. They're going to let these token Republicans, just speaking politically, get into office and do some sort of stymieing and then bring in an even greater accelerant because you've already been desensitized because if the previous guy can push back at least half of what the guy, you know, for example, if Trump can push back and let's just say, and this is even a generous figure, a quarter to a half of what Obama did, then Biden comes in and ramrods even beyond the point that Obama did. See, it's it's, it's still a net gain for them. They have to take losses in the short term, but they're still winning in the long term. And that's probably the model they're going to approach. How sustainable that will be in a long term, I don't know. But it does seem like that's the model they settled on. So I, I would anticipate that, just speaking election-wise, just speaking just to put this all in perspective that, yeah, we'll probably see some sort of Republican win in 2024, put some sort of delay to this. Instead of the 2030 plan, it'll become the 2040 or the 2045 plan. And then the next guy who gets into that will push it even harder. And we, as the people, will become more and more desensitized to this as time goes on. Right. And I think what you're describing also is a kind of a containment, uh, the extension of a containment policy that we've already um have begun to associate with uh, Musk. Uh, that is, uh, if you look at the push for green energy on a geostrategic uh, point of view, uh, basically it's to wean the West off of Russian energy. That's its primary focus, right? Um, it has morphed from uh, we've got to go green, we're killing the planet, to uh, we've got to stop using dirty Russian energy and start using dirty uh, energy from somebody else. Of course, it won't be dirty because it won't be Russian, right? Uh, in the same way that um, Greta Thunberg has gone from, um, you know, being a, a champion for saving the planet uh, by bringing awareness to uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption, uh, she's now going to fight capitalism, right? These are all uh, issues and subject matters that are uh, closely aligned and related within, you know, basically neoliberal ideology in the, in, the, in the West right now. So if you understand it from that point of view, right, that it was that was just a prepper for this, Right. Um, You could see that America is lining up their own kind of containment Caesar to to come along. Right. Um, Like you, I think they want someone, if not a Republican, he, he could be or she could be a Democrat that behaves more like a Republican on some of these issues. Right. Uh, because I, 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 you know, no one is going to recreate uh, 
you know, German industry in America by solar panels and windmills. It's, it's not going to happen, right? And the kind of changes that they want to see, you're going to have you're going to have to have enormous amounts of, po of of the population, millions, using public transit that is electric, right? But you're still going to need some kind of energy. Now, I know what they're doing. You know, they're trying to. There's all kinds of disinvestment that big oil uh, and gas companies are doing, right, under the guise of being concerned about the planet. But the reason they're doing that in the first place is that shareholders in these um in, in um you know for these industries don't get the kind of returns that they do and why is that important because it keeps saudi arabia in check and it keeps russia down right that's its role right that's why they're doing it it's not because out of the, the goodness of their heart or their like there's no army that's going to function. There's no military that's going to function on um, on something else other than gas and oil. It's just not going to happen. We don't even have to get into the hundreds of thousands of, of products that have nothing to do with making cars move that depend on the petroleum industry, right? So my, my guess is, uh, like you, that they're going to push this back and that's going to allow room for somebody who won't be as woke um uh who uh is finally going to satisfy the people with a uh uh not so much green energy push but industry uh that way you know even trump can get credit because that's what he wanted to do but those stupid idiots didn't let him and now they're taking pages out of his playbook and so on and so on so I, if it, if that's their strategy, it's it, it could mean a, a a very successful strategy, right? They will pump out more green energy, you know, battery dependent um, vehicles, for instance. I'm I'm very sure there'll be more buses and so on. But um, you know, the population will have to get much poorer when that happens, right? Um, yeah, it also because it also does serve as a cover for the inevitable decline in living standards that were set up before that. So they can say, well, it's just a sacrifice that you're going to have to make rather than this is inevitable because of our mismanagement of the economy and the way we played our cards over the past 30 years as well. So it's also yeah. a, a good cover story for them. Right. And, and ultimately it's to sever the ties between Western investments, uh, that that could anyway benefit the 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 Russians vis-a-vis -vis their uh, energy exports, and um, it, it it is a it is a new Cold War. That is that is what we're in, and uh, yeah, I would see this as a uh, another part of uh, the containment strategy. Tesla is 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 part of this. It feeds into that, uh, you know. In, man of industry, um, American mythology, Galt, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's what I see. Uh, the, they're going to revive that myth, mythology, okay? Um, there was something else I wanted to say, but you, you go on and maybe I'll re remember it. Well, that's all I had for the U.S. news, and then I was going to bring in our last topic of the show, which is getting into some of these news about these protests in China as well, if you're right for that. Uh, Okay, but we we have to talk about Kanye. Oh, how how could, I I would be remiss if I didn't. I can't believe I almost forgot. Okay, so <laughs> where the hell do I even start with something like this? So okay, as as I'm sure you all know that Kanye ha has Kanye West has been ingratiating himself with a lot of the online right culture, which culminated in that very odd interview on the show that Alex Jones had, of course, with, I think they had, they, they, they dug Milo Yiannopoulos out of whatever time they had. They found uh, uh, Nick Fuentes from whatever platform he's operating on now because he's been banned from almost the entirety of the internet. And he was just saying all these off-the-wall things. <laughs> I mean, I I don't know what to do other than, than just laugh because it's, look, I'll 
I'll just come out and say it, that I don't think any of this has any serious political viability, but you all know how I feel about electoral politics and political viability anyway. I think that's all shot. I don't think there's any future in any of that, so I support whatever absurdity we can throw out there, because frankly, it, it lives up to the farcical name that the American Empire has built for itself over the past 100 years, and really, there's no more fitting scenario than something like this happening. So, I mean... Some people are speculating that this is actually going to be a serious political movement. Some people are speculating that this is just controlled op. This is just to funnel people into some sort of new 2016 movement on steroids so they can bring them back into the system, whatever. I, I think, you know, fair enough. I, I can understand why people, especially with how ridiculous politics has gotten, think that this may be a viable avenue for some sort of change. Whereas I also understand why people are saying this is some sort of controlled op movement. This is to bring people back into the fold. At this point, while I think both sides have their valid points, I, I think it's a bit of an irrelevant debate given, given everything else that's going on. And I'll just say, because I, I know that you're all clamoring to hear everyone's take on this, I, I think regardless of who it is, the situation is just so absurd that in a way we just need to embrace the chaos. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think there's there's several ways to to look at this. Uh, I, I, I've, I've, my interest has been piqued by by several takes, even even that of Richard Spencer's. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine, and you know, he was very frustrated. He was frustrated, for instance, when when Kanye walked out on Tim Pool, like he thought he could maybe achieve something if he could articulate his thoughts better. Um, uh, then, like, I, I said to him, have you seen his appearance on, uh, on Alex Jones? Now, I will admit, I wa the, the whole thing is about two hours and 50 minutes. There are extensive commercials. I watched about an hour and five minutes. I have seen... A, at the very least, a dozen uh, outtakes, but I got to see about a third of the, a little over a third of the, the entire interview in its proper context. And I said, I said to him, you know, because he visited another friend of ours, right? And they were sort of, you know, both disappointed. And, um, and I said, you know, you're looking at this kind of the wrong way, right? Like, you're not going to find somebody who's like reasonable who's going to talk about the overrepresentation of you know Jews in powerful positions or Jewish power w within the west and how that has a negative impact on particularly people of european heritage or people in european countries like it's just not going to happen right uh, like part of the problem is you have this great hope that 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 could happen, but it's not going to happen. So it's not like it's not any big loss, right? And expecting, like, you know, he was criticizing, why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? And I said, he's an entertainer. He's, he's like, he's a musician. You know, sometimes he does say pretty ingenious things. And, and it's, you know, he's a, he's a musician. He's not, he's, he himself, I think, on some level knows. Um, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't. Uh, that that he's not like built for this, right? Like, so one take is uh, don't take any of this like uh, all too seriously. Uh, that it's going to accomplish something. Uh, they would never let an articulate white man talk uh, the same points that Kanye is, is making. Kanye is only making these points because he's black, because he's wealthy, and because he's helped in the proliferation of, you know, black culture, which is instrumental to America's influence over the world. Every, every country has its own rap stars now, right? That can't be underestimated. And, of course, he does have a previous reputation of not being the most even-keeled or stable person. So if they're going to allow something, they're going yeah, to yeah. allow it from somebody 
who is like that. As you were saying, you're not going to get like an articulate white man who's going to come out and get these points. And at this point, you're not going. To, I'll I'll just say this flat out. Some a point I've made before, but maybe I haven't. Put I mean, into, whether the white it, man is articulate or not, yeah. they would never let him. Yeah, I, yeah, I I get where where you're getting at. But point being is. There is no room in America, or frankly, in my opinion, the Anglosphere as a whole, and even increasingly the Western world, for any real intellectual political movement. That that opportunity has passed. That time has passed, and it's playing to a world that really does not exist anymore. And You're right. You, you hit it on the nail when you said, that doesn't exist anymore. Because you could go back to the 80s and 90s and find guests on Donahue, Montel Williams, like all, all these like old talk sh- morning talk shows where they had inarticulate and articulate people like make some of the points that that Kanye is talking about people didn't take it seriously then because in many ways as a society was not as affected as it is now but the project over the last 20 22 23 years has been to ensure that none of that gets gets through at all right um uh, think of uh, James Burnham. Uh, think of um, what's his name? The guy who um, not Bob Dole. Um, Ross Perot. No. Um, <laughs> I, I had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I, I can't believe I've forgotten his name. Pappy Cannon. Right. Like all those guys have been cleared out. Right. Like. And the whole thing started because, you know, Kanye went to a concert wearing a a T-shirt that said white lives matter. And it just escalated from there. Right. Because, you know, basically Jewish people were very offended by it. Other people were, too. But it was them who put the screws on him. And that's what forced him to talk. He's a stubborn guy. Right. He's willing to lose a lot. Uh, He's I think it's possible he's willing to lose everything. Absolutely everything i think i think he really believes he is on a mission and this is where i'll agree with richard spencer saying you know he's he was doing like a like a uh, a chat on uh, on twitter i'm sorry for this rant i promise it won't be much longer oh no please do continue so um they had a liberal woman that was on and one of the things that the, one of the things that they all agreed on uh was that um, the Christian messaging throughout the interview was extremely palpable, that there was an energy about it. And that in Spencer's mind, this was no longer even about politics. This was entirely about culture and, and you know, theology. It was entirely about the direction of, you know, where Something the country has. Yeah, much, much, exactly. Much, much more meta. And um, it, it, it's it's transcended the, the, the whole thing. As far as they're concerned, uh, this is completely cutting edge. Now, the other viewpoint is you turn on the television and you see a guy with his face completely covered by a mask. Right. And like the average person who sees that, they're not going to watch it. They're going to think this is insane. What the hell is this? Like. First of all, Alex Jones himself is an insane enough platform, right? And then uh, now, let's be honest. One of the reasons why Trump got elected is he appeared twice on Alex Jones, right? And there are a lot of hilarious outtakes, uh, not outtakes, but clips from from this visit because he's, you know, <laughs> you have Jones saying, you know, like, I mean, the Nazis were thugs. Not all of them, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there well, was, there well were, I like Hitler. There, there were several people who had <laughs> who had pointed out that uh, it's come to the point where Jones is the most reasonable man in the room. <laughs> <laughs> like it, like you can't deny that 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 stuff is like getting crazy, right? Like this people he didn't even know until two weeks ago. Uh, for who was it? Oh, damn it! Um, forgive me. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, like that whole thing with the net and the Yahoo, Yahoo chocolate drink. Oh my God. That was, 
it was bizarre, right? And like you could look at it another angle and say, is this really like like the kind of framing Christians would want? Y- you know, uh, is it like is is this like the the best spokesman for it? Like, you know, it's. There is an energy there for sure. And I, I do think he's sincere. Um, but uh, I, I think I think most people are going to look at it and, you know, his account was suspended, was suspended today because he tweeted this image of a star of David with a swastika embedded in it that yeah, the, the, the reality and UFO cult yeah. used to use in the 90s. It's so, it is so out there, so crazy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say anymore. It's the American Empire. America, in, you into... keep surprising me all the time. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the American Empire coming into its, uh, let's just say, fullest form. <laughs> Yeah, you really want the American Empire to die, huh? Still, I mean, no, you still want the American Empire to die? I don't think so. <laughs> We're gonna need truckloads of Monterey Jack. <laughs> yes. All, oh I mean, my goodness. Hey, what, what am I gonna do on the show once the American Empire dies? Like, I, I <laughs> it's it's in my own best interest to keep this farce going. It it's wow. That's. Slava Ukraina, I guess. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, with that being said, uh, the last thing I, I, I do have is the China protest. So, there were protests that cropped up last week regarding the lockdown policy in China, something they've called zero COVID. Now, this is not too surprising. And China's always had the very harsh crackdown. Now, it, it, it is strange because early on, then you had in 2020, when they had a completely open New Year celebration, I'm talking Western New Year's, not Chinese New Year, versus many of these Western countries going into 2021 were still doing the mandatory mask, the mandatory uh, social distancing, all, all, the, all the regulations that they had brought back into place. And then you had, in late 2022, after all this passed, after you saw a large concession on a lot of these things, just over the past couple of days, you have seen China re-implement the lockdowns. And you saw this a few months ago, when there were localized lockdowns in Shanghai. Many expected that was a political maneuver, because many of the CCP elites who are at odds with Xi Jinping, are based out of Shanghai. It, yeah, and remember, it, Shanghai is like where all the 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 transition uh, operations take place for for transgender tr- transgender yes. operations take place there, right? And it's a major shipping port too. Yes, it's a it's that foothold in the Chinese elite, and they're all based out of Shanghai, and they're importing not only western goods but apparently western values as well with some of the uh, <laughs> with some of the gender clinics they have going on there so many speculated that this was an attempt to crack down on rival political factions which i think that time was and now you have these more recent protests where they're continuing these crackdowns now many speculated at first a lot of the protests were from the usual suspects of course, I don't fault anyone for thinking that, but I didn't actually didn't see too many of those takes, which made me realize that these lockdowns at this point are so reviled that very few people are even willing to attribute them to the CIA. <laughs> that that all across the world, it, it's become such an unpopular idea that everyone's like, well, of course people are against these. Now, of course, to point out the hypocrisy there was a lot of mm-hmm. comparisons mm-hmm. to the trucker protests in Canada and th- that while you had stupid Trudeau <laughs> <laughs> while you had uh, Trudeau and, and Biden and the, the like calling on China to end these lockdowns and listen to your people of course you still have the ongoing prosecution of the truckers 
under the emergency acts that was implemented earlier this year in Canada. Now, one take I did see, I'm not going to co-sign it, but I'm going to put it out there because I do think it's worth sitting on and thinking about and, you know, getting other people's opinions on, is that this was a bit of a 4D chess move by China where they implement these lockdowns, they get the finger wagging from the NGOs, they let go of these lockdowns because they're now unpopular, they're no longer accepted, they gain the approval of the NGOs while also ending a, let's just say, outdated policy at best. Now, again, I don't co-sign those. I thought it was an interesting take from, let me just get the Twitter account here that put it out so I can give them proper credit on this, from a, an account called Garoman, which is uh, at G-E-R-O-M-A-N-A-T. So, again, I'll, I'll let everyone think on that, but I, I do think it was a combination, at least this time around, of both overzealousness on this from, of course, the Chinese bureaucratic class and political rivalries and factions, especially considering the dynamic we discussed between Shanghai and Xi Jinping. We'll see what actually comes out of these. When they first started, I thought this was going to be a much longer process. Maybe my view of this was colored by the recent events in Iran, but it seems at least any information about this has come to a halt. But you do also have to remember, it's very dubious, especially when it comes to lockdowns, when it comes to news out of China, when this all first started, because it's been shown that a lot of the early footage released in February, March, April 2020 turned out mm-hmm. to be, either be exaggerated, if not outright fabrication. Yeah, they were hoaxes. Yeah, so you, you had to take this with a large grain of salt. Thus far, I don't see these going anywhere, really. That could change in the future. But for a while there, it looked like China was pissing away its own success by continuing these policies that were really, that, again, nobody supports anymore to the point where it was comical to the degree that the Western elites said that, well, there's no reason for these, you should end these, you're just using these as political tools. <laughs> and, of course, I know point of hypocrisy means nothing, but it was a very entertaining position to see them put in, especially for Biden and Trudeau, who have been, and especially Trudeau, who have been at the forefront of this insanity. Yeah, he's despicable. Um, you know, the other thing, too, that I think is playing in China's hands uh, quite well is, you know, we talk about COVID, but, you know, we forget about SARS. We forget about their swine flu that happened, the the, the poultry flu that happened. Um, there's been an awful lot of that happening in China. And I think China is now... Let's say there's not, there is no serious COVID problem in Shanghai. Let's let's pretend that's the case. And Xi knows it, and he's doing this to disrupt trade, to increase um, problems in the West. Um, it, it, it's to clamp down on any kind of rebellion within the CCP with regards to Shanghai. Uh, it's clamping down on any kind of liberalism in that area. Um, and the the COVID lockdowns are just a kind of a proxy excuse for that, for them to get the message. Let's let's say that's the case. The other, But we shouldn't forget that there have been probably attempts by the U.S. to sabotage China for many years by trying to get some kind of a, of a pandemic uh, going on in there. I mean, that was the entire point of the Wuhan lab Lab, the Wuhan lab going even before 2020. That's why right. you had all these Western countries invested in these virology research institutes in the point. heart of China, and not only in the heart of China, but in the parts of China that are still markedly less developed, that are definitively second world, where the healthcare infrastructure is much weaker. Right, right. So, um, you know, whether it's a real concern or not, like the the fact is, you look at the last twenty years in China, and this has been like no other country has had so many of these outbreaks, right? And uh, I'm one of those people who uh, who believes that America played a role in 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 Wuhan. I have, I'm just not going. And and if people want to, you know, find the interview um, on geopolitics and empire, which is a good 
a, a good channel on YouTube. You can also find them on, on Odyssey and BitChute, I believe. Good Telegram um, thing, too. Yeah, a good Telegram, too, right? And you can find the in interview that uh, the host did with uh, Ron Unz. And uh, I've pitched this before, but there's a lot of good points there. And um, uh, especially when they kind of let the cat out of the bag in the spring about American involvement in this, and then they clamp down on that right away. And then in the fall, um, I can't get into it now because it's already two and a half hours long, the show, but... Uh, there's been a lot of funny business going on there, and I'm just saying, if people want to understand how, you know, for good or for ill, how, uh, you know, in all honesty or in dishonest uh, fashion, how the, the the Chinese government could use this, well, they have ample periods within the last 20 years where uh, pandemics occurred. Right. And that makes it easy for them to, um, you know, do whatever it is that they're they're doing right now. Um, that that adds as a justification for the kind of narrative that they've been they've been building. And we know, like some strains of, of covid were actually um, pretty deadly, particularly the one in Iran. Yes. And. It, especially early on with a lot of the information we didn't know and, and countries like China and Iran, which do have less developed healthcare infrastructure, especially in certain regions of those countries, it was a much murkier p picture. But I, I have to co-sign everything you said, and I would also recommend checking out the Ron Unz interview. And that's all the news I had for this week, at least at this time. And, uh, yeah, again, we are pushing that two-and-a-half-hour mark. So if you have uh, any final remarks, the floor is yours. If not, I'll go ahead and bring things to a close. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I was going to say, just to go back to Yi, you know, about strategy and containment, you know, um, this friend of mine, I also had a conversation about him with uh, with Milo and everything. And, you know, I was just saying that, you know, because uh, Josh Neal uh, with the, that Jefferson dude had um, a show, but I was already talking about this with my friend before the show, and that is... Um, you know, Milo had a lot of resentment towards Trump and felt like Trump abandoned him. Well, welcome. Um, you know, the visit that they paid to Trump during Thanksgiving um, was in a way to smear Trump so that he couldn't win in 2024. But there's a different take. You could look at it like that's, that's a total possibility, especially when you're talking about Milo Yiannopoulos. OK, it's. I mean, he's recorded all his conversations. We know he's leaked some of the stuff to the FBI. Like, if you really believe he's a sincere Catholic right now, I, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you should believe that. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, and, even even in the early days, always mired in scandal. Just just one of those kind of people. Right, and he he could like these things because he just likes you know breaking taboos and. It, it, it's kind of an addiction for him. I don't know. But the thing is, is you could look at it another way. It, and, and that is that Trump needed a scolding. He needed to be scolded. And um, that was part of, let, let's say, in the bigger picture, these guys are dorks and they should never have done it. If we're interested in, you know, Trump getting reelected in 2024, I mean, you and I know it would probably mean nothing. Nothing would would, would change. Um, but for those out there who are invested in that, you know, you could look at it as this was um, a way because, you know, one of the things that they said on the Alex Jones show, as well as their visit, uh, according to their own words, was why didn't Trump do more for the people who were locked up and are still locked up uh, because of January the 6th? Like, why not? Why not do more? Uh so you could look at it that way. He deserved to, to be scolded that way. Or you could look at it, you know, it's part of a containment operation to make sure he doesn't run, that the Santos is the, is the guy who runs. And, you know, uh, and Fuentes is astute. You know, he said, if that happens, the Santos will lose. It's a very good chance that that will happen. 
Um, so this, there are a couple of ways of looking at this thing. And uh, that is, uh, the, oh, yeah, Trump actually uh, on Truth Social has now is now calling uh, Nick Fuentes little Nicky. <laughs> this, I, uh, I, it's like even with how absurd things have gotten over the course of the past six years, I don't think you could have told me this in any believable fashion even a year ago, even six months ago. I don't think you could have told me any of this in a believable fashion, and I. I'm I'm just at a loss for words, not out of any like strong emotion, but just out of sheer confusion at this point. Yeah, like in my days, <laughs> the the big hubbub was, oh my god, why is Reagan president? He used to be an actor. Like <laughs> nobody cared when he was governor of of California. But anyway, suddenly it became a problem when he was a, a president. But anyhow, it was it was that was the kind of criticism we had in, in my day um, uh, about like, you know, this is a government and, you know, there's a certain level of seriousness that has to be practiced, right? Like if anyone told me <laughs> in 1985-86 that we would, this is where we would be in 2022, I said it, but you're insane it's it's you know it's not that bad dude <laughs> i mean yet here we are <laughs> yeah so that's all i've got <laughs> i'm really excited in a very perverse way for 2023 and what it holds yeah yeah it's gonna be something but with that being and, said, and we thought 2022 was exciting <laughs> but with that being said uh keep your eye out for future episodes especially the 2022 in review episode and for our alternative platforms which will be linked below and thank you everyone for tuning in to another episode of the war report we will see you next time and goodbye goodbye and, good, and take care